What does Babe Ruth, Nelson Mandela, Marilyn Monroe, and Connie Hasmatali have in common? Anybody could guess. Especially on you know, the Marilyn Monroe, Connie Hasmatali thing. What do they have in common? Anybody could guess? Good looks, yes. They were all adopted. They were adopted. You know, adoption gives us this incredible picture of an invitation of identity and acceptance. We've been studying the book of Romans, specifically chapter 8, and one of the blessings in that chapter is the the idea of adoption, that we are adopted into God's family and that we become sons of God. Now, for all the ladies here, I don't want you to feel left out at all. And we're going to look at this verse. So Romans chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 14. If you don't have your Bibles with you or smartphone and you got one of those booklets, thanks to Ruth Ellen that we have it all there for you. So verse 14, it says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Of God. Now, in that context, the word sons is not referring to gender, it's referring to status. And in Roman culture, only the son, the oldest son, would inherit the family's estate. So Paul intentionally, he could use other words to refer to children, but he uses a very specific word that really invites male and female. That God's heart is for all of us. The invitation that we would become, regardless of male or female, that in Christ we have the right to be his son. The moment that you place your faith in Jesus Christ, your status changed. You are no longer a slave. You're no longer a servant. That you are a son. And with sonship comes incredible privileges. And one of them, this verse says to us, is that we are led by the Spirit. Now the phrase led by the Spirit is in the present tense, meaning that it's not just one time, that it is ongoing, that when we are children of God, we live our lives not simply from what we can muster ourselves, but we live our life with the understanding that our lives are being led by the Spirit of God. Now, I want to assure you when we talk about being led by the Spirit of God, that this is not simply for an elite group of people or a strange group of people. All of us, we know people who often tell us how much the Spirit told them to do this or the Spirit told them to do that. And in one week, it's like the Spirit has changed their minds. They're kind of like what I call granola Christians. You know those kinds of Christians? They're fruits and flakes. And, and, and nuts in many, many ways. This verse is not talking about that. And it shouldn't be strange for us as God's people to think that the Spirit of God would lead our lives. You know, in the Bible, there are many examples of this. When you think about it in the New Testament, there's a story about a man by the name of Philip. And it says that the Spirit of God led Philip to come alongside a chariot of a man from Ethiopia, he was an official. He was looking at the scriptures. He couldn't understand it. And the spirit led Philip there to share the gospel with him and to baptize him. There's this other great story about Peter. And Peter gets this vision and the spirit of God leads him and instructs him to go to a man's house by the name of Cornelius. And there he leads Cornelius and his entire family who was a Gentile to Christ. The Spirit of God led Paul's ministry. It didn't only tell him where he should go, but it told them where they shouldn't go. That Paul and Silas and Timothy, they were instructed not to go to Asia and Bithynia to preach the gospel. So it shouldn't be strange for us as children of God, sons of God, that our lives would be led by the Spirit of God. 
Now, for many of you that are here today and all of our students, many of us, we're here. We've come from other cities, bigger cities, and we've ended up in Musha. Some of you have come from other countries. Now, if you think about it, of all the places in Canada that you could live, I don't know about you, but it was the Spirit of God that brought me to this place. It's not strange for you to believe that as a son of God and sons of God, that the Spirit of God would lead our life. You know, there are many forces and many voices that desire to lead us. So how do you know when it's the Holy Spirit leading you. You know, Jesus described the Holy Spirit. He said that the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. Now today, the word truth is, could be interpreted in so many different ways that most people today, they have determined that truth is something that they decide for themselves. But the truth that Jesus was referring to is the truth of the Word of God. And how do you know when the Spirit of God is speaking to you? You have to know the Word of God. So as sons of God, we must know the Word of God. It is the Word of God that transforms our minds. And it empowers us to be able to understand the Spirit leading in our life and the ability to obey it. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Spirit of God, because we are sons of God, children of God, renews our minds so our life could be led by the Spirit of God. Not only does the Spirit guide us, but it also frees us. Look at verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. This is really the second blessing that comes from the Holy Spirit from this passage. He frees us. Now, the three essential aspects of this freedom. The first is this, that we're no longer slaves, but sons. Verse 15 speaks of receiving a spirit that does not enslave us to fear. You know, under the old law, we were bound with condemnation and with sin and with death. But now through Jesus, we walk in freedom. We're no longer held captive to our guilt. And we no longer live in fear of God, that we are now a son of God. The second aspect of this fear is the idea of adoption. The concept of adoption is very central to the Apostle Paul's message. While it really wasn't a part of the Old Testament Jewish tradition, it was certainly a very prominent thing in the Roman culture. And in Roman culture, society, adoption was not only legal, it was highly valued. That wealthy families who did not have children, or they did not feel that their, their son was the one that they would hand over their inheritance to, that they would adopt someone into their family. And with that adoption comes everything that that family had to offer was handed over to that person. The third fact about adoption is that it gives us the full rights. Again, in the Roman culture, an adopted child was immediately granted the full rights and privileges of a natural born child. When you were adopted, what happened was that you lost every connection to your old family. You lost every bit of the debt, every bit of their name, every bit that went with that family. Now you were 100% a part 
of this new family. And every benefit from that new family was now yours. What Paul is saying, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Spirit enables us to be sons of God. And with that comes all of the privileges there is from heaven now becomes ours. Our past sins, our debts, our guilt is wiped away. And now we've received the privilege of being a son of God. Now, there's something really wonderful about adoption that's very different than having your own biological children. When you have your own biological children, yes, you make the choice to have a child, and so you have the child. But when that baby is being delivered, you, you, you can't look at that baby and say, take it back, put it back. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want that. You have to take what it is. But adoption is very different. Adoption is a choice that somebody makes about you. Adoption is somebody looking at you and seeing the value in you and welcoming you into that family. Adoption is the idea of now you have this brand new identity. And with adoption, Paul says we have this incredible privilege as children of God to address God as our Father. And he uses this incredible word. Before Jesus comes, the idea of God as a Father and in the ancient times, the way that they looked at God and the gods where they were very much removed, they were very angry, and the only way that you could get anywhere close to them was that you had to prove to them and that you had to show them, you had to appease them. So it was all about what you did. And Jesus comes along and he's going to teach his disciples how to pray. And he uses this incredible word, Abba. And he addresses God in a way that they would have never thought about God. And the idea about ad adoption is that it brings us into this incredible relationship with God. The idea of adoption is that our God, our Heavenly Father, He's not so removed from us. That in fact, He's close to us. That He desires to have this close relationship with us. That even when we falter, that even when we mess up, that we have a Father that loves us. A lot of people struggle to understand God as a father because of their relationship or lack of relationship with their earthly father. I've said this to you many times. Uh, I have no memory of my dad. My dad died when I was very young. And I grew up as a, a young person, as a young, without a father figure in my life. In fact, most of the male models, uh, uh, roles that were around me, they were not good at all. And I remember coming to Moose Jaw as a young man and, and in the dormitories at International Bible College. I was there uh, over the summer and nobody else was there. And I, and I remember watching a, a, a father and son interacting with one another and grieving in my own self that I never ever had that opportunity. But I remember so well the Lord speaking to me and telling me, I will be your father. I will watch over you. I will care for you. As a young man, it was revolutionary in my life. Because I grew up in the church, but didn't grow up thinking about God in that way at all. And I'm here to tell you that when you are adopted into God's family, that we are sons of God. And I love what he says, that we could cry out to him, Abba, Father, Daddy.
Papa. That he hears your every cry. So not only does the Spirit lead us, not only does the Spirit free us, but it offers us something deeply personal and profound about our relationship with God. It assures us. Look at verse 16. He says, the Spirit himself testifies. That's this incredible word. The book of Romans is a book like a deposition that a lawyer is bringing to a court to prove its case. And he uses this word that the Spirit testifies on your behalf. And it testifies inside of us that our, that our spirit, that we are children of God. So this is more than a head knowledge. It is this divine testimony within our hearts where the Spirit of God speaks directly into our spirit, confirming our identity as beloved children of God. I want you to think about that for a moment. That the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the stars and all of the planets into their places. He whispers into our hearts, you are mine. This isn't some kind of abstract theological concept, but this is a intimate daily reminder and reality to us that the spirit continually reassures us that we are deeply loved that that we have been accepted just the way that we are you know there's so many times as christians there are all of these voices Sometimes we don't always measure up. And when, when we don't, the enemy comes. The enemy is the accuser. He accuses us. He always wants to pull us down. Many, many times we become our most hardest critics in our life. But I love what this verse says, that the Spirit of God reminds us. It doesn't just inform us about this truth, but it reminds us again and again that we are, it bears witness, it gives testimony that we are the children of God. That many, many times, even when we condemn ourselves. I love this incredible verse. It comes from the book of 2 Timothy, verse 2 and 13. It says that, that even when we are faithless, that he remains faithful. How many of you are glad for that today? Even when we don't measure up. See, to be a believer, to walk with Jesus, it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect in your life. If that was the case, I don't know about you, I would not make it. But by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the assurance that we have. You see, God doesn't invite you to be part of his family. And then when you don't measure up, he just says, you're out. No. Maybe your family determined that you were not going to be part of their family anymore. But God, when he gives you the invitation, when you're in, I want to tell you that you're in. Our salvation is not fragile. It is secured in what Christ has done for us. It's really not all about what you do. It's what has already been done for you. I want to invite our worship team to come back. And we're going to sing a few closing songs. But I want to ask you today, do you have this assurance? That deep in your heart, do you know that you are a child of God? That no matter what happens, that you belong to him. If not, why not? Why live with the uncertainty 
when Jesus has given you this opportunity. You know, Jesus didn't just die for this, for humanity in general. I want you to know that he died for you. You know, the cross is very personal. That he took your sin, he took your shame and your brokenness upon himself so that you could be forgiven, you could be restored. And in the drama that we had, that your name would be written in the book of life. Here's the thing about the book of life. God does not have an eraser. When you're in there, you're in there. And as a church, one of the reasons why we came out here, why we pushed past the walls of our building to come here, that just in case, there might be someone like you here that don't know that there is a Father in heaven that loves you, that wants you to be a part of his family that created you for that purpose. So the decision you have to make today is, am I going to continue to be a slave to the old way of life? Or am I going to come in to be a son of the Most High I pray today that you would make that decision. When we close our service, we're going to have a time of prayer and our team will be at the front and they would love to talk to you more about what it means to be a son, a child of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today so much for this incredible invitation not to continue being slaves, but to be sons. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are welcoming us into your family. I pray today that we will receive that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Love you very much.